Luke chapter 6, Luke 6, 46 through 49. I promise, hang on, get your Bible, get it open, whatever your device is, and, and just, and, and, and we're going to blow through this thing, okay? I know everybody's like, he's not serious. I am, I'm serious. So get ready. Luke 6, 46 through 49, the context, just a little bit. This scripture, this is the back end of the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' this is Jesus's words, okay? So Jesus has preached this message, and this is the back end of that. He's closing out his sermon with these words. Now, this is the, the, um, the words here written down in Luke. We have this similar account in Matthew. Now, some people, and it's a little longer in Matthew. Actually, the message is a lot longer. The sermon is a lot longer. Some people say that these are the exact same accounts. Some say that they're different accounts. They're just very, very similar. Either way, I've got an opinion, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But um, either way, this, this is Jesus' words speaking, I believe, directly to his followers and his disciples. And oh, by the way, there just happened to be thousands and thousands of people there too. But I believe the audience was a specific audience. It was to his disciples, his followers. Okay, so just, just remember that context. Too. Extremely um, familiar scripture. Verse 46, Why this is Jesus. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. That person is like a man building a house who dug deep, and he laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came and the river crashed against that house, it couldn't shake it. You know why? Because it was well built, Jesus said. 49, but the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed. And the destruction of that house, that house was great. It was great destruction. Now, again, we've heard this scripture, okay? We've, we've, we've read this. If you've been in, involved in church for any length of time, I'm sure you've heard this scripture. Verse 46 really ought to sound familiar for you if you've been here the past six, seven, eight months. When Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things I say? When I read that this week, I immediately, maybe you do too, I went straight back to James. We spent a lot of time in James, in the book of James, and then we followed up the book of James, jumped right into the, into the book of 1 John. And in both of those books, and actually now once you start reading even more in the, in the New Testament, you see this common theme. I had a funeral. I had to preach yesterday, and I was preaching out of, out of Titus. And even in Titus, this theme, this theme of obedience, this theme of obedience. And Jesus is saying to the disciples, along with those else, who else were, were listening, why do you call me, some of you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things I say. So there's this theme of obedience. It, it was important to Jesus. And we saw it in James, James 1, Be doers of the word and not hearers only. That it's not good enough just to hear it. But you've got to, you got to do it. You've got to put it into practice. The whole theme of James is faith without works is dead. Yes. Now, again, we're not talking about salvation. Hear me. Now, I'm not going to re-preach that message from a few weeks ago. We're not talking salvation here. This obedience piece. The obedience he's talking about now is after you've trusted, you hear, but you're not listening. You're not obeying. You're not acting on it. And James talks about that over and over and over. John did the same thing. We look in 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Just You don't have to flip there, but um, verse 3, this is how we are sure that we have come to know him, by keeping his commands. The one who says that I've come to know him without keeping his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him, John said. We flip on over in chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. 
This is how we know that we love God, that, that we love God's children when we love God and we obey his commands. For this is what love for God is, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. So this theme of obedience is over and over and over. And I like to think that James and John both got this idea, not only by walking and seeing Jesus model it, but they were in the audience. Now, James being the half-brother of Jesus, it took him, we, we know, it took him a little bit longer to get it. But obviously, based on his word, James got it. James heard Jesus that day. And there was some time in his life on down the road that it struck him and it hit a nerve and he wrote the book of James and the theme in it was, You're, you say you believe, but you don't obey. We know John was in the audience. John heard it too, which is why we see what he wrote. So this deal, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things I say is important. This obedience thing really does matter. So let's look at the scripture then. So Jesus says, why do you do that? You, you don't do the things I say. Let, let me give you an example, Jesus said. Let me give you a picture. So we're talking now about two, two things really, foundations and storms, foundations and storms. And I want to ask you the question, then even here this morning before we get started, as you can think as the scripture, how's your foundation? Now again, I, I'm, I'm preaching to the church, and I believe Jesus was speaking to followers and believers, and here's why I say it. Verse 47, I'll show you what someone is like who comes to me. So you can take this context, and, and, and I'll, I'll go there. The context of salvation, you can preach it that way. And I could, and I will, real quick. If you're in this room today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you have no foundation. Bottom line, you have no foundation. And when the great storm comes, and the great storm being the death of your life, when you die, that storm will cause a great destruction. There's a place called hell, and it's real. So apart from salvation, apart from relationship with Jesus, no foundation, when this great storm comes, it, 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 it's a great destruction. On the flip side, if you know him, if you've put your faith and trust in, in him, and by believing in him, you have a solid foundation and no storm can touch it. No storm. You're indestructible, okay? Your soul is indestructible. Now, we, we, could, we could preach that and call the piano man out and, and, and play and have an invitation and go home. But I believe the context, though, well, let me back up. If that's you, I'm praying right now. If that's you and you know that's, that's you and you have no foundation, you can get that today. You can get that today. You can leave different today. Here's the context, though, that I think Jesus is preaching this on. I believe it's a context of growth and it's a context of discipleship. And it's a message for the church. It's a message for us who follow him. Let's look at the similarities between the, the, these two men in, in this story, in this scripture. Here's the similarities. Both men, it says, listen, I'll show you what someone is like who comes to me and hears my word. So he comes to me, hears my word, and acts on him. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And then the storm comes. So here's the similarities between the two. I believe both of these men now, when we see, see the, the, the guy in, in, in verse 48 to, or 49, both men come to Jesus. That's why I believe both men are, are followers. Both men heard Jesus. Hearing Jesus, hearing the word, listen, you, you're hearing it preached today. When you read it, you're hearing it yourself. There's other ways of hearing it. But both of these men came to Jesus both of these men have heard the word. They've heard from Jesus. Both of these men built the same house. There's no difference in their houses. 
I mean, if you've ridden around our community lately, you, you go through neighborhoods, you see neighborhoods that look just like that. This is boop, 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 boop. And from the street, they all look the same. So both of these men built a nice three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath, front porch, swing, dog in the back. I mean, they look the same. From, from the street, they look exactly the same. They're the exact same house. I believe both men built in the same location. They built a nice house down by the river. They were neighbors. So you got both men who have come to Jesus. Both men have heard Jesus. Both men have built the exact same house. Both men have built in the exact same location. They're neighbors. And both men experienced the same storm. And this is important. Both men experienced the exact same storm. Listen, storms happen. I've always, I've had people ask, you know, why does, and I've, I've probably asked the question too, why do bad things happen to good people? And I've always said, listen, bad things just happen, okay? Nobody is exempt. Good people, bad people, nobody's exempt from storms in, in life. I, I, listen, you can be in the exact perfect will of God, Okay? The, I mean, you, you, you're, you're right where you're supposed to be in relationship with him and get hit by a storm. Matter of fact, a little disclosure. If you are a follower of his, get ready. Storms are coming. This whole you know, fluff of come to, come to Christ and, and man, all the clouds blow away and the rainbows and, 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 and that, that's, that's not true. You can be right smack dab in God's will and be in the middle of the biggest storm of your life. On the other side, you can be as far away from God as you want to be and the same type of storm hit you. Storms don't care. Storms don't care who you are. Storms don't care what you got, what you don't got. Storms happen in our lives. And the exact same storm hit both of these men. Again, both men came to him. Both men heard the word. Both men built the same house. Both men built it on a nice little lot down by the river. And both men experienced the exact same storm. But there's two different results. There's two different results. Verse 48. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and he laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood came, the river crashed against that house and it couldn't shake it. One man, one man chooses to act or obey what he's heard. Again, we're talking about a follower, a follower of Christ. Can we be a follower of Christ and hear and not act on what we've heard? Absolutely, we can. This man did not do it. And here's the deal. One man acts or obeys on what he hears. And you know what the, what the result of that is? The result of that is growth and maturity. Another good word for that is discipleship. And discipleship and growth and maturity takes time and it takes effort and it's hard. Look at the scripture, the way he describes him. He's like a man building a house who dug deep. The man started digging and he had to keep digging. Bo Whitmire was in here in the, in the, in the last service and he, he pushes dirt for a living. I've always called him, he's a, he's a dirt pushing pastor. He gets to sit on a tractor and push dirt and minister to people that I'd never get to be around. But I said, you know, a guy like that, when they start a foundation, you can lay the thing at the house out and you can see, and you could go into a situation, and if you're a contractor, you probably know this too, you can go and think, man, this is gonna be easy. This will be easy. All we gotta do is knock that down and push them. To, and every, ne never is it ever that way. There's always something that happens along the way. And Bo's not gonna start pushing dirt and all of a sudden hit a stump and say, well, I guess that's it. We can't build it here. 
Or you start digging and digging and digging and you hit, hit, hit something and, and, and you're like, well, I guess that's it. This obstacle now, I can't do it. It's gotten too hard. I'm going to throw my hands up and now we're just going to cut a corner and do something different. No. Discipleship and growth and maturity takes time and it takes effort and it's hard. And sometimes we go backwards before we can go forward. But this man, listen, this man dug deep. I've got this little bitty B by deep and it tells me to go down here on the bottom and read this lettering that is even tinier than this lettering. And that says, that means literally dug and he went deep, which tells me this man, it didn't, he didn't just start digging and it all worked. He dug and he dug and he dug and he dug. You know what he did? Based on this, he heard and he did. And he heard again, and he did. He heard again, and he did. And he did that over and over and over. He heard the word, he trusted it, and just obeyed, and just kept acting, and just kept acting. And you know what ends up happening when we do that? All of a sudden, we realize we're standing on a firm foundation. There's a firm foundation. That's the result. There's this firm foundation. The opposite is true, 49. But the one who hears and does not act, same man came to him, heard, but chooses not to act. One man doesn't obey or act. And guess what happens there? There is no growth. And there's no maturity because there's no foundation. Now again, this is a believer. This is a follower. But for whatever reason, they're just coming and listening and walking right back out and getting in the car and driving until the next Sunday morning. There's no personal time. There's no, there's no small group. There's no discipleship. And you know what? If you do that and you keep doing that, just like if on the guy's side, if he keeps digging and keeps digging and keeps working and keeps digging and keeps digging, all of a sudden there's a solid foundation. I'm telling you, on this side, without it, your foundation's going to erode. And here's the thing. Enter the storm. Because the storm's coming. And for both of these men, one man's done it right and dug and dug and dug and has got this maturity and got this, this growth and this foundation and the other one doesn't. And when the storm comes, we see the first one, the, the word says it wasn't even shaken. And it's the same river. It's the same storm that caused the river to rise and crash into the house. That's the terminology. That's, that's a powerful storm. And it didn't, even, it didn't even shake the first man's house. But the second man's house, the collapse and the destruction, the Bible says, was great, which tells me there wasn't a thing left. There wasn't a thing left. Because that man had spent time after time of just hearing and leaving, hearing and leaving rather than hearing and doing. One man with a foundation, one man without. Some notes, I, I, just in reading this week, this, this, this is not me, I'm not this eloquent, but this is what one writer said. Wisdom and obedience keep the house standing. Wisdom and obedience keep the house standing. To the contrary, a house built on foolishness and disobedience is bound to collapse. Since building a house takes time, commitment, and consistency, diligence, and care, this is a fitting metaphor for the life of discipleship. That's what I think Jesus is talking. It's this life of discipleship. Calling Jesus Lord will inevitably lead to floods. Be they persecution or calamities or just general trials of life. When you call him Lord, you understand you're putting a bullseye on your back by the enemy. 
And I don't say that to scare anybody. Because the story says if your foundation is in him, it won't even shake. It won't even shake. Will Jesus' disciples hold under pressure? Will they? I think the answer is yes. If they stand on the solid rock. On the solid rock. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. We bust that in a hymn right there, good one. I don't know why the hymns always matter so much to me, but you sung that. But have we sung it and, and, and just walked out and forgot it? Or have we sung it and, because it's the truth? I'm done. But I want to I transition with, with one more little thing, Okay. It's funny when you, um, sometimes you get a long, a long runway before you preach and sometimes you get a short runway. This, this week was a short runway. I don't know which one I like, the, or I, I hate both of them, I guess, but I, I don't know which one's better. Having a long runway and then you're, you're preparing and it's like, oh my gosh, or having a short runway and having a, maybe the short runway, I'll tell you this, is put my, is, I've had to trust the Lord a whole lot more in the short runway. God, I need you. But it's interesting, on a short runway, though, what you end up doing is you go, there, there's a well that you go to before you preach, and the well is, is where you're at right now. Well, what are you reading? Where, where, and, and here's where I was this week when I got the call to ask to, 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 to preach Sunday. I've been reading some books lately um, by a man named Gene Edwards, old, old writer. And again, I've, I've read through those books several times. He's written a, a bunch of books. He's a fictional writer. Some of it's not, but some of it's fictional writing. I, the best way I can describe him is like a, um, he's, he's like the, the chosen in written form. He's taken things in, in the scripture, spe specifically in the New Testament, where I was th this week, and he just puts, he puts some, some skin on, on some, some of those stories and some of those places that where it's easy to read the book of Acts and think that, well, from chapter 2 to chapter 3, that was five minutes, and chapter 3 to chapter 4, that was another. There, there's years in between these, these things sometimes. And for me, it just, I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just built that way. It, it puts pictures and, and it puts context sometimes in some of these, and it, it just takes some liberty on what some of the conversations may have been like between the characters that we know so well in, in the Bible. This week, I just finished another book that, and, and that, that I've read before, but I, I, I was in the middle and, and just finished it. And it's in the early church. This is after um, the resurrection, the birth of the church. And this is the, Paul's journeys in, in, in preaching and, and establishing the church uh, amongst the Gentiles. And he goes and he takes the journey. He's with Barnabas and they go and they're planting churches. And, and of course, the church with, with the Gentiles looked completely different than it did in, with the Jewish community. Paul loved that. It was beautiful. I mean, you, it, there was no tradition. There was no structure. I mean, a guy be up preaching in the Gentile church and people raising their hand and asking questions and interjecting and, and people running around. I mean, it was just, it was controlled chaos. And Paul loved it. There was, there was freedom in, in, that, in those churches because there was no true background. All they had been given, listen to me, 
All they had been given was the gospel and the gospel only. And they believed and trusted the gospel of Jesus. And that's what the church then was. So it was a beautiful thing. And Paul had established these churches. Well, right behind Paul, after Paul had established those and they make a journey back, after he gets back, there's a group of folks that come in behind him I like to call it a storm. A storm hit those four churches. There were people who did not like that. And they went back behind Paul as a storm and came back to those churches and said, no, 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 Paul's not, that's not right. Paul's telling you, the, he's not telling you the truth. There's these extra things that you've got to do to be a believer. One being circumcision, one being the, the other thousands of laws that you've got to, in other words, you can't just, you can't just trust and believe and be a follower. There's all these things, which is, we, we know today, that's just not true. So this storm blows through these four churches. Gene Edwards then paints the picture of Paul getting word of that. Paul then sits down and writes a letter to those churches. We can read the letter today. It's the, it's, the, the, it's the book of Galatians. And it's a pretty scathing letter in that Paul is very disappointed and worried that some of those people were falling away. Their foundation was eroding. So that's the purpose of the letter is to that church. And in it, he, 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 it there's some tough love in that letter. But it's the truth. And so Paul writes the letter, sends the letter on to the four churches, and then him and Silas, I was going to say get in the car and hit, but they don't, they don't get in the car. Him and Silas hit the road, and they're, they're going to head now to those four churches to address those four churches with that letter going before them. Gene Edwards does a great job of painting this picture of what Paul felt on that journey to the church. What are they going to say? Well, what's, it, will there even be a church when I get there? When, when I step into town, are they going to, you know, throw me out? But the guy already been beaten and, and he, he just, his, the anxiety and the depression and the worry of Paul, the apostle Paul was great on his way to those four places because he had no idea how the church was going to respond. But here's what happened. In all four of those places, Paul was welcomed with open arms. They had received the letter. They read the letter. And you know what? They loved Paul when he got there. They responded in such gratitude and such support and such love of Paul. And here's, here's the deal. Why such an incredible response, I thought? Here, here's, here's the deal. That, those churches, here's why they responded the way they did. Because they had been shepherded well. Paul had shepherded those churches well and had given them, listen to me, a solid foundation built on a faith and a belief and a love for Jesus. The storm was no match for that church. And I believe they responded with a love for Paul. Listen, they responded with a love for Paul, not just because they loved Paul, and they did, but they responded with a love for Paul because they had been taught to love Jesus. Listen, this church has been shepherded well. This church has been shepherded well. This church has been shepherded well. This church and your family has been shepherded well. And the response 
of this place because the foundation has been preached over and over and over and over. That it's not a love for Brian. It's not a love for the state. It's a love for Jesus and Jesus only. But out of that love for him, out of that love for Christ, the natural response for a church is to love the shepherd. So the storm was no match for that. Those churches, the storm is no match for this church either. Listen, when a storm hits an individual body, it, 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 it hits all of us. And the response from Chestnut Mountain Church will always be, number one, we've come to Jesus. Number two, we've heard. And number three, we will act appropriately. We will act in love and support. Why? Because we love him. We love Christ. And I'm telling you, ain't no storm can match that. And it won't. The truth says the flood came and the river crashed against that house and it couldn't shake it. And it won't. And it won't. So here's the response today for you. Number one, let's go back. If you're not a believer, you don't even have the, an, an, an idea of what that foundation, you've never prayed to receive Christ, you can do that and get that foundation settled today. And you can, well, there'll be folks down front, you can do that. But the second piece, listen, church, is your foundation eroding? Are you just coming and hearing and, and, and sitting on a pew and then leaving or are you putting into practice what's being taught and preached from this pulpit every Sunday? Are you involved in a small group? Do you have an idea of what discipleship looks like? If you don't, your foundation's eroding. If you are, if you are, the storm is no match. The storm is no match. Whatever your need is this morning, this altar's open and you can find the answer to whatever question you got right here. Father, we, uh, I know folks are like, I can't believe he's done. God, we give this time to you. You know the hearts, you know the needs, you know the anxieties, you know the joys. Father, you know all those things. And God, you want to individually do something in the life of, of, of individuals, but then collectively as a church, God, you want to do a work here too. God, we are so grateful that we've been shepherded the way we've been shepherded. You know, we're, we're, we understand the storms sometimes. We don't enjoy them, but we know they're no match for you. So God, you just have your way here today. And we love you too. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.